so today we're going to continue chapter six, uh, which is uh, linear model selection and regularization, which uh, Justin went over for us uh, the first half uh, before the new year. It's been a while, so I wanted to go back and look at the learning objectives that uh, Jonathan pulled out of this uh, before we go on. So we looked before at um, selecting a subset of features to include in a linear model using forward stepwise selection, backward stepwise selection, um, best subset selection, um, and then also using shrinkage methods to constrain the flexibility of linear models, uh, namely the lasso and the ridge. Um, that was a very brief <laughs> uh, reminder that I highly recommend watching the video. I rewatched it yesterday to remember what the heck we had talked about. Um, so that's available on our YouTube. Today, we're gonna to talk about reducing the dimensionality of the data for a linear model um, using PCR and PLS. And we're gonna talk about the similarities and differences there. Um, and then we're gonna talk about some of the challenges that can occur when fitting linear models to high dimensional data. I am not like prepared to talk about the lab. So I don't know that this will take the full hour, but this is how much I have ready to go. So, and we can discuss after that what we're gonna do from there. Uh, maybe it will take the whole hour. There's, I don't know, we'll see. All right, so jumping to my sections. All right, so this is section 6.3, dimension reduction methods. Um, the idea is you take your data and you transform it before you use it, um, before you use it for linear regression specifically. And you make these uh, Z uh, subset of, or not really subset of parameters, but linear combination of the original predictors, these new uh, predictors. Um, and so, yeah, those are uh, like a, a uh, we'll talk more about exactly what they mean in different cases, but it's some constrained subset, uh, I mean, a combination of the original predictors. Um, and <laughs> they have the sentence, linear regression using the transform predictors can often outperf outperform linear regression using the original predictors. Um, like they had one engineered case where it does, they, um, we'll talk more about like when it can and when it can't, um, when we get there. All right. So they, I, I, I found this, like the math, um, interesting to get down to the magic of you doing, you know, doing these combinations of sums and that really the idea is your betas and your new linear regression are constrained to um, how you define your your linear combinations of the parameters. Um, and since the betas are constrained, uh, it can increase bias, but reduce variance uh, when you are using a small subset, uh, or not small subset, again, it's not a subset, but a, a smaller number of new predictors than the original predictors. Um, just basically, this feels a little magical because all of your um, principal components are combinations of the existing dimensions. So you're still really using those dimensions. Um, but it's interesting that it, because of the constraints you put on it, uh, these new parameters uh, count for less variance, basically. Or, uh, yeah, less variance. All right. All right. Um, whenever I'm talking about principal components, I like to bring up this uh, image that Allison Horst created that um, really helps to kind of wrap your head around what principal component analysis is. So imagine you're this whale shark and uh, you're trying to swim through this uh, delicious krill swarm and the idea is that um, you know you want to get as much of the krill as you can unfortunately everyone has their cameras off so I can't capture the image that I wanted to capture of your natural thing is everyone does this looks at the camera or looks at the krill like this and I was going to add a screenshot of that to the notes but we don't have one so um, but yeah so the idea is you know you just turn your head and so you you change the uh, axes um, to capture as much variance as possible. Um, they're going to talk about this more in chapter 12. Uh, 
but the idea is the first principal component is the line that best fits all of the data. So if we look back at our krill, it's, you know, this line here, it, it captures the variability in the, in the krill. Um, and then the second is orthogonal to the first that best fits the remaining. So that would be at this wide point here that gets the most variance in the remaining uh, information. Um, and then et cetera, which it's harder to imagine in higher dimensions, but still you're going like, you know, out of the screen if there had been more um, variability to capture. All right. And then, uh, so yeah, to see that using some actual uh, data from the book, we've got uh, these two variables, population and ad spending. The first principal component captures most of it, of the variability in those two variables. And so if you um, plot the first versus second, you can see like the, um, the residuals effectively of how far they are from that line. Um, and then each of these is again, a linear combination of the, the original data. Right. Um, I, I took these next couple of figures from the book out of order on purpose because they show this example where this is an engineered example where only, um, or where the, the first couple the first few linear or uh, principal components capture um, pretty much all of the um, variability that matters in this data. And so we can see that like right here, when you've got just a, I don't know, five, four or five components, you get uh, all of the variability or you capture a lot of the variability of the data and you do really well when you do a uh, regression of that. You can compare that to Ridge and Lasso. The idea, oh, so one important thing in PCR is you're assuming most of the variation in X is associated with variation, uh, I've got a typo there, but variation in Y. Um, when that assumption holds, which is what we're looking at in this case, uh, PCR can do very well to get you a really, really good fit. Um, and you mitigate the overfitting by reducing the number of variables. Uh, again, I've I've kind of corrected myself to catch this a few times that it's not feature selection because every of the components depend on all on the other variables. Now, some variables matter more in a given component, but they it is a combination of the variables to make each component. Um, and so I, uh, it's more like the ridge than the lasso, and they had a they have a note that technically the ridge is a continuous version of um, actually of um, I think PLS, but um, I it, they said, you know, that's in the advanced book and I hadn't gone through that to kind of really wrap my head around that, but the ridge, it, it's a lot more like ridge than like lasso. Um, and, oh, and then another note that they make is that it's a good idea to standardize your variables before you do PCR, because if you have one variable that has, you know, it varies by millions, that's gonna dominate all of your principal components. So you want to make sure that they're all on the same or roughly the same uh, range. Okay. Um, when the variation in Y or in X isn't strongly correlated with the variation in Y, uh, it's not as effective. This is actually the figure they show first for a PCR. And like, you know, it does like, especially this one, it, like it, it does, uh, like the best is almost all of the variables here. So the number of components is almost equal to the number of um, predictors. And so um, it's not as good of a, a case for PCR in this case. Um, and they, I, I didn't go back and grab them, but they show that the, the Ridge and Lasso do better for these than PCR does um, versus you know, on this one. PCR does slightly better than both Ridge and the Lasso. All right. Um, so, you know, okay. So when it's not strongly correlated, PCR doesn't do very well. So that's why there is partial least squares. Uh, partial least squares is like uh, PCR or PCA, but it's supervised. So you use, use Y to help you choose 
where that um, uh, line is. So here, um, the dotted line is where the, the first principal component and the solid line is the first PLS. Um, and in this case, population matters more than ad spending. And so it's a little bit more weighted, uh, sorry, matters more than ad spending for the thing you're trying to predict. You're trying to predict sales in this case. So for that thing, population is more important. So you weight that first uh, PLS component towards, uh, towards population a little bit. Um, they talk about in the book, and also I watched the videos that they made for the first edition that uh, it's often not uh, any better than Ridge or PCR. And um, so, okay, cool. The supervision can reduce the bias versus PCR, but it increases the variance because you're um, like, you're going back to basically using those, uh, using the relationship. Um, and so you, you, you know, you can overfit really badly, basically. Um, yeah, that's pretty much everything they had on PLS. Any, before we go on, any comments or questions about either of these techniques? Looks like, no? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so next we, we talked about, uh, or they talk about, and this is actually a new section, I believe, that wasn't in uh, the first edition, but talking about some considerations for high dimensions. Um, they point out that uh, you know modern data, like um, we're probably all aware of, can have a huge number of predictors. Um, they give the example of you might look at a half a million um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, where basically um, they're just looking at all of these factors in, in people's DNA that may or may not have anything to do with the problem you're trying to solve. Um, another case that they gave was every word that is ever entered in a search box um, and just saying for each uh, instance of a search, does it have this word or not? So you've got a, a one or a zero on those. Um, so you can have these really, really huge number of predictors and you might have not that many actual instances of those predictors being used. So they, you know, they gave examples where you've got like a hundred patients or a thousand patients and 500,000 SNPs for each of those patients. Um, what can happen there when, when that number of, uh, you know, number of rows is way lower than the number of columns, um, it becomes really easy for linear or not becomes easy for linear regression will memorize the training data whenever when n is less than p it'll just come up with a fit that exactly fits the training data because it's got um, more parameters than uh than instances and uh the the simple case they show is when you've got um uh two data points and uh two predictors um that you just, it's a line um, that you can say, you know, X versus Y basically on two data points. Sorry, that's with, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, and so you know, you'll, you'll get an exact line, but this line is just, um, where are we? It's whatever, it's two, I think it's these two, that and that. And so everything is off from the line that you make from that. That's not a good fit. Um, So yeah, uh, it, so it can really it can be really bad on the test data when you do that. So you you know you as your number of variables goes up, your test mean square error can go just crazy bad compared to the uh, training mean square error. Um, a way to get around that is basically this chapter. That's what, everything that we were talking about in this chapter. Um, you reduce the flexibility. So with lassos and ridges and PCR and PLS uh, to, to help. Um, so this, the figure here is showing for lasso, um, they showed degrees of freedom, which is like how many non-zeros are there in the model. And um, that each of these plots is generated by increasing that Lambda. So 
um, degrees of freedom correlates to higher, like um, more degrees of freedom is a lower lambda. Um, and so you, you know, tune in and find uh, the number of uh, non-zero parameters that, that work for this model, but they show that, you know, if you've got 2000 predictors and I think they had a hundred rows here, you can't find, you can't like get rid of the noise. You're, it's, you're gonna uh, fit to the noise. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that is the curse of dimensionality that when you have features that don't have anything to do with what you're trying to predict, those features only hurt. Like they're, they are noise in the training that are gonna be different noise in the test. They have no relationship. And so um, you can end up with a worse model by including more parameters. Uh, and then the, the important thing that they point out in this section is that, um, I mean, they've been talking about it anyway, that you don't really wanna look at your training set mean square error or um, P values or R squared or whatever to really determine if your model's any good because when you have a high number of P parameters, um, especially when you have a high number of parameters, they can be wildly different from the test va values. So have a test set that you're actually using to evaluate um, whether the model's any good. And that's all I have. I didn't realize it was gonna be so quick. Um, took a long time to get to that set of notes. <laughs> so I don't know, does anyone else have any thoughts about the chapter, any comments? anything all right i just have since there's time i have a yeah. stickler question okay uh in one of your slide in one of the slides it said that uh when n is less than p the you know uh, ordinary least squares will memorize the training data isn't it the case that that's when n equals p yeah um i think you are right At, like they kept talking about n less than p, um, but yeah, the example, like if you, uh, this yeah, is two, two data points and yeah, that's n equals p. So um, let me, so six, four, actually, I'm just going to fix that while we're sitting here. Um, yes, it's, it's, so when it's, when n is less than p, it's even worse. I guess it'd be the, uh, the thing to watch out for that there. When n equals p, there we go. Um, yeah, anything else? That is definitely a good point. Then I'm glad you corrected that because I kind of glossed over the fact that I had uh, written that a little off. No, I just remember feeling uh, strange that I'd never seen, I've never seen PLS in my life. Oh, um, well, <laughs> so like I watched the video that they recorded, the lecture video that they have for this, which um, by the way, I'm gonna share that in the channel. I found their, the YouTube channel of one of the authors of the book where he recorded lectures for the first edition of the book. Um, and so they have playlists by chapter um, and actually let me throw that in the Slack right now, because that, you know, very helpful, obviously. And they basically are like, yeah, PLS exists and there are fields that like it. And, you know, we don't, <laughs> is basically what they said. So some fields use it. Um, I did like, so the, the argument that, um, you're not constraining, like you're using Y. So it's basically you're fitting twice. It's kind of what's happening when you, you fit to get the PLS uh, dimensions and then you use those to fit a least squares. So why, um, if you're using least squares, PLS isn't really doing that much because it's like, it's it's separating out the steps of doing it. Um, I don't know. I had seen it uh, in... Um, another another book that we read, another book club. Um, I can't think if I've ever seen it outside of these two books. Um, was it the Tidy Models book? Uh, 
No, it was. Oh wait, actually, Tidy Models did talk about it. Um, and then also the uh, uh, practical statistics for data scientists mentioned it. I think. Um, so it's in. I guess it's in three books that I've read for book clubs. So it might. I've never used it. Um, I think so. I think it's probably more useful. I don't know. I, it might be more useful if you're doing a model that isn't linear regression. Although the joke is that all models are actually linear regression eventually if you um, go back down far enough in the code. So um, I don't know. It's an interesting idea. It, it, I don't know. Like I was, I was going to say it could be an interesting way to kind of find um, like latent variables, maybe, um, because it's a combination of your variables that have meaning for what you're trying to predict. So maybe it's a way to, you know, like combine things in meaningful ways, but I don't know. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Actually, I think that was one of the last chapters. Oh, actually, I think that's the chapter we never actually did in Tidy Models uh, Cohort 1 because we couldn't get the scheduling to work out. So, um, but I read it. Uh, yeah, anything else? So I think... Um, It's useful to think about, like, you know, they gave the case of um, the 500,000 um, single nucleotide polymorphisms as a thing that is common to work with, relatively or relatively common in modern, um, like, uh, biomedical research. And the whole point is, it's like you've got all of the easy to measure SNPs and clearly not all of them have everything anything to do with every condition and so um, you need techniques in order to get rid of the ones that don't matter when you're trying to do any sort of prediction um, and if it with that many you better have a lot of rows or here even these techniques probably aren't going to be enough to get rid of the um, the extra info all right, so yeah, <laughs> we've got two links in the, the chat to the section on PLS, so in uh, tidy models, which actually. I want to apologize, Frederica uh, posted the chapter 17 <laughs> of tidy models. Uh, I zoomed into just the uh, PLS section, so um, they both covered the same chunk, I guess. Yeah, so um, it's, yeah, supervised version of PCA. Um, Maximize very variation in the predictors, but also maximizing the relationship between those components and the outcome is the idea. Um, anyway, um, cool. And yeah, so I put in the in the Slack, I put a link to uh, these videos. Um, I, I found them very helpful to to hear like kind of their thoughts that didn't make it into the book and um, like, oh, the, like they don't mention in the book that, uh, or I don't remember them mentioning that, which one is it? That one of the authors is uh, like, wrote the paper where the lasso was um, introduced. So um, yeah, <laughs> like that was interesting. He has a lot of thoughts on the lasso, unsurprisingly. <laughs> So, um, which I guess, you know, is helpful when saying that they're like, oh yeah, just use the lasso of PCR and PC or PLS aren't that good. Um, but the idea is not every, like sometimes different techniques are better than others. And so knowing about them all is useful. All right, anything else? All right, so we will discuss in the chat whether we will do a separate club for the lab or just move on to chapter seven 
Um, like I said, I haven't even had a chance to look at the lab yet. I don't know uh, how complicated it is, um, but it's useful to do. Um, and we'll talk about that on Slack. All right. I will see everyone on Slack.